What's up, guys? It's Mark Russell, Clarity Market 770 Arborist, ISA Certified Arborist, and Licensed Public Adjuster, Insurance Adjuster. This is the insurance standards. It's going to be a very high level, just to kind of give you lay of the land um, on insurance claims. In case you don't know, I got started in trees in 97, got a uh, license as a arborist, certified arborist, maybe 06 to 08. I don't remember exactly. And then got licensed public adjuster 1718. I have since done 450 claims that I never went and visited one single house ahead of time. Not one person from my company ever visited the house. Everything was off hourly rates and I haven't added it up, but it's millions of dollars worth of work. I'm going to create a video by the time we launch. You'll see it. It'll show you the pictures on all of them, all everything. So let's jump into the ISO. So what does ISO stand for? Insurance Service Office, as a matter of fact. And the Insurance Service Office is basically like TCIA or was. So if you look on, you can see it here. Insurance Service Office, Wikipedia, uh, was formed in 1971 as an advisory rating organization. It was a nonprofit at first, nonprofit organization. Then I think they changed to a nonprofit corporation. And then they ended up getting bought by Vera Risk Analytics, I think in 97 or 89 or something. I don't, uh, 2009. Okay, Vera Risk Analytics, to give you guys an idea, is they're the guys who make Xactimate software. Um, they're big. ISO, from my understanding, just this is really high level and we can just keep it high level. Basically, ISO was formed because in insurance, you have lawyers, you have adjusters, you have um, different states and jurisdictions, you have people who move back and forth. And sometimes you have multi-state companies under policies that like cross boundaries. So the problem with all that is there's there needed to be some amount of standard, right? I In fact, just to bust one myth real quick, I used to think before I got, I became a licensed adjuster, I used to think that policies were different at least homeowner policies, like each company kind of had their own policy. ISO, there's actually a thing called ISO paper, right? They're an ISO form. So an ISO form basically took the, the, the perils, the perils are the causes of the loss, like the causes of the thing that caused the person, like wind is a peril, flood is a peril, fire is a peril. These are all perils. Um, but basically ISO took these perils and put them into three basic forms at first was HO1, which stands for homeowner one, homeowner two, and homeowner three. Now that was a long time ago. And now at this point, um, and, and, and hold on, before I move forward, they took those forms and they, they made them in such a way that the insurance commissions in each one of the states because each insure, each state has their own commission. Almost all of them do. So the point is, when it's a lot of work for the commissioner to go through and look at, like, you wouldn't want to, like, if you have 30 different or 20 different insurance companies working in your state, ugh, going through all of those papers, like, that's a lot of insurance policies to look through and validate that they don't break the law because in the policies, they have to make sure that they are like kind of in tune with the laws of the land. Well, ISO kind of did that, right? And and then they they made it sort of I, I would I would say vanilla to cross across all the different states. And that helped because if an adjuster like all of a sudden moved or a lawyer moved or a judge, a case got moved from one jurisdiction to another, everybody was on the same page. That's what ISO did. Then they ended up selling off right, or getting bought out. And they are the largest, now Verisk, I believe, is the largest repository of claims files. Man, it's like, I think, 600 million claims files. Let's see, is uh, is that right? Um, let's see, control F M I L L. It doesn't say it here. I saw it somewhere. 
That's a crazy amount of data, a crazy amount of data. But that's what Fair Risk does. Now, regarding forms, different insurance companies, there's one other type of form, and that's called writing your own paper. So there's a saying with adjusters, every policy is different. The only time every policy is not different is if you're working off a very standard ISO form. Like uh, if it is a, 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 a policy where it's like State Farm or Allstate and they've done what they call written their own paper, well, then that, there are deviations. And what happens is the, when, a, when, a, when a, a company needs to go into a state with those deviations, they actually do have to pay to get the, uh, the insurance commissioner to look it over and lawyers and say, okay, this is right, this is wrong or whatever. And that's called writing your own paper. And so let's move on. Let's talk about some of these policies. Um, one of the policies is basically... They all start HO for what we're concerned with, with trees, and this is going to be very tree focused, HO one, two, and three. So let's look at, this is lemonade site, HO one, two, three, five, six, eight. Let's see. And then under the III, by the way, Insurance Information Institute book market, it's a great site. They got lots of good stuff. Let's see. On this is, we've got, let's see, we've got one two three four six and eight is that the same way one two three five what is five six and eight what's the difference what's an ho5 here higher coverage limits yeah rolls royce so this is a, this is something with lemonade i think that they offer this um because on here ho4 is a renter's policy and they don't even mention HO5 here. So that may be just something direct. So let's jump into this. HO1s, okay, cover 10 perils. Let's just stop for a quick second. A peril is the thing that caused the loss, okay? So on an HO1, you have 10 of them. On an HO2, it has 16. If you jump over here, you come back over. Here's the first 10, okay? Then, starting on number 11 is fallen object, weight of ice or snow, uh, discharge overflow of uh, steam within plumbing, sudden or accidental, tearing apart, cracking, burning, bulging, steam, hot water, freezing, plumbing, sudden accidental damage from artificially generated electrical current. That's obviously not lightning. That's the other six. Okay, that's the other, that, that would probably be like... Um, yeah, uh, let's see, does not cause a, to a tube, transistor, or similar electronic component. Lost to. Okay, so I would think that that would be like your electrical company blowing out a whatever, but that's not my specialty. My specialty is number two. Windstorm, baby. Windstorm. Like, wind is great. I used to think it was fallen objects, but I quickly realized that the peril that we almost always deal with is wind. Funny thing, lots of people think when they see included bark, that lightning, that it's lightning. I'm sure you guys have heard that. It splits open and you see all that included bark. Important, very important to make a differentiator on your invoice. This was wind. Because if they tell them it's lightning, there are limits on lightning versus wind. Big limits, as a matter of fact really big limits. Lightning typically has a $500 cap where wind is completely different peril. And if it falls on coverage A, which we'll get into, there's no cap. Like it's the value of the house. Okay. We'll get into that later on, but that's a important little tidbit. Okay. So going through HO1, we've got these. HO2, we've got the six more. What's HO3? It's all perils except flood, earthquake, war, nuclear accident, uh, uh, nuclear accident, blah, 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 blah. So basically, it's also called a special policy. A special policy because it includes everything except for uh, whatever is excluded. The other name for it is an exclusionary policy. That's an HO3 so the next one is an HO. We're not going to 
do this thing here, a special uh, HO3. Uh, we're going to go to an HO4. This is a quick side note, and I mentioned, okay, this is a renter's proper uh, policy. Okay, this is a quick shout out to an app that you should pay for. It is called, the app is called Land Glide. Get Land Glide. It is a really cool app that could potentially save your stinking tail. And shout out to uh, Dustin um, for sharing that with me, M Meyer. Um, okay, so this is how it works. Land Glide, Mayor Meyer, Dustin. Anyway, it allows you to go through it. It works with the GIS system. And anybody's house, see on the bottom, it's not in focus, but it, it'll bring up anyone's house anywhere and let you see who the owner is. It's 10 bucks a month, dude. So why is that important? And why does it have to do with the rental policy? When things get hectic, right? When Hurricane Zeta came through here, uh, we had one guy just like randomly make up a number. That's always a risk, right? It's It would be fraud on their part to make up a number and say that, that hey, bill my insurance. But regardless, they're authorizing you to do the work anyway. So like they're authorizing you to do the work. That was a guy who owned the house and made up a number. And I was like, dude, you can't do that. But the thing about Land Glide is you never want to get caught up in a situation where someone's renting a house and the tree came down and like hit their bed or something and they called and let's say they don't have a good relationship with the landlord or the landlord's traveling and they're freaking out because this tree is sitting in their bedroom. And so they call and they file for their renter's policy for their stuff. They get a claim number and then they hear about you. You've got to verify that you're working for the homeowner and not the renter. Land Glide is the reason because that's what a renter policy is. And renter policies do not cover, I don't believe, let's see. Maybe they do have, look, okay. Maybe they have the same perils, but buddy, the limits are going to be different. Like they're just going to be different. Like with the limits on an HO or on an HO one, two, and three are typically the value of the house when it falls on the house because you can't repair the house. And we'll go into that later on. But the point is, is that removing the tree off the, off the house is, um, that's the limit, the value of the house. But on a renter's policy, man, maybe there's a coverage limit of 5,000 bucks. That would be a problem. So for obvious reasons, it's, you wouldn't want to get into that situation, not to mention you don't want to be working on someone's property who didn't authorize you to work on that property. So land glide all the way. Let's keep on going, guys. HO6, this is a really good little uh, little snippet here. HO6. Um, HO6 is for condos, um, like condos, shared dwellings, um, and they they have weird coverages because sometimes I think there are two policies in one. There's the drywall in section. That's for the person living in it. So if the tree comes through, busts their drywall, that goes, I, and I'm not 100% clear. We did a huge job. Um, we did a huge job. I don't know, it's like a $70,000 job. Uh, I don't know, four months ago, and it did hit a condo. It split between a couple houses. It made it through the drywall or through the side of the house and into, so I wasn't worried. She had a, she had a condo thing and I didn't check it, but it would get a little weird. If it just hit a condo, you need to verify, like if it fell on a condo, but didn't make it inside, there can be some weird coverage issues because if that policy is drywall in and she files a claim, well, then you might be, like trying to build the wrong policy because it, it, maybe the condo unit themselves, the HOA has a completely different policy separate than that. The one that you've got a claim number for, and maybe she filed a claim in error or he filed a claim in error. Just be aware that that could potentially happen to your own deeper studies into that. There's DP ones, dwelling policies. Uh, and, and I didn't bring them up here, but DP one, two, and three, very similar to HOs. 
I can tell you that they have, oftentimes they have differences on coverage B. Coverage B dwelling is different. Um, uh, DP policies, DPs are for renting. Uh, not the same as a renter's policy. A renter gets a policy for their couches and their beds inside the house. DP policies are for if you're renting the house out to others, someone's renting the house from you, you don't live there, that's a DP policy. And oftentimes they have like different coverage limits, like for separated garages, like I did this one in uh, Hurricane Zeta that was a separated garage, fell on that and a fence. And their max coverage was like 10 grand and our bill was over that. And be aware, like, that's it. Like, you can't get over max coverage on certain things. It's not possible. Although on debris hauling, sometimes they'll roll that into the deductible. Um, and that'll be for another video. But uh, the point being is, um, on DP policies, just be aware that there's going to be different coverage B policy limits. Just be aware of that because it could catch you especially if it's not on the house. That's all I'll say. By the way, as a side note, you can't look at a homeowner's policy. I probably should have said that way earlier. You cannot look at a policy. You can't look at a policy and interpret a policy for anything that you're doing. That's illegal. It's, it's adjusting. You cannot tell people about benefits. Like all of this obviously is for entertainment purposes only, but you can't coach someone on their policy. You have to get licensed for that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking up some stuff online. You can look it up, you can educate yourself, but I'm not like making a coverage decision here. I'm talking about some stuff that happened, but it may or may not apply to your situation, but don't ever, I've seen some guys before, like pick up a policy and like start looking at it and being like, uh, and being like, oh yeah, it's covered here, covered. You can't do that. You need to get a public adjuster or a lawyer involved. Or you can tell a homeowner, hey, this is where I'd suggest you look and talk to your adjuster about it and say, get the copy of the policy, but you can't ever speak for them. You know, you cannot speak for them and you can't tell them this, oh, you got coverage. And then there's another thing about just flat out change the price on your bill. Like if the, like there is um, rumors, if you will, that you can't adjust your bill based off of coverage. No, bill's the bill, sorry. I'm not an adjuster. Here's the bill. You're not getting me like that. I'm not going to adjust it. Bill's the bill. Cost incurred. And we'll go into that later on. But like even adjusting the price on your bill, just leave it as an outstanding balance. But if you change that price, boy, that's that is that might be adjusting based off coverage. And then you're then you're adjusting a claim without a license, and you could get in big trouble for that. Okay, so we looked at H01. H02, H03. So now let's look at a couple definitions, types of adjusters. I didn't ever know this uh, on a lot of the time uh, before I became licensed. There are one, two, three, four, five types of adjusters that I know of. Um, okay, so, and basically four of the five work for the carrier or on the carrier side. One of the five doesn't. Desk, dude who sits behind a desk. Uh, okay. Field, someone who gets the, the pad of paper, they're out, they're taking pictures, they're documenting. They don't adjust as much. They may do an initial scope and then, and then they save that file off. It goes to the desk adjuster. It's out of their hands. They go on to the next one. That's field. Okay. Um, then, then there are cat adjusters. So CAT adjusters, just as a side note, when a claim happens, the carriers have a certain amount of time of performance. They have to get out there and they have to do a certain amount of stuff, you know, start the claim, document the process, get the ball rolling. Okay, they have a side that they have to do. The homeowners also have a side. They have to pr provide a proof of loss, which documents everything. That they've lost, uh, uh, that they have lost out on. That's a little bit of a dicey thing because most of the time, the in-house adjusters do it, uh, or the the insurance adjusters do it for them. But in the policy, it's always you have to pr do these things, or you could like we could deny coverage. But that's kind of duties after a loss. That's not 
sticking on subject, Russell. Let's go. Okay, so desk field uh, independent is um, independent and cat are similar in the attribute of saying, hey, sometimes during a big uh, a big disaster, these these carriers just flat out don't employ a lot of adjusters. So they need extra help to get the ball rolling on thousands of claims. So independent field adjusters work for other companies and they skip around from different carrier to carrier, depending on who has the work. Um, uh, but regular independent adjusters typically have a lot more ability to like adjust the claim, if you will, and like talk coverage. Cat adjusters are a stopgap, lowest level of adjuster. I don't even think, I, in some cases, I don't think they have to actually, the I think the test is different for a cat adjuster if there is even a test. They can't talk coverage. They're just there to take pictures and get the initial scope into the desk. Um, I ran across a cat adjuster during Hurricane Michael, Panama City. Man, that place was blown apart. And they couldn't get people there quick enough because there's just so much destruction. So they just like hire anybody, give them a camera and a set of rules and say, here, go out here, get this into the desk adjuster so that we can get the ball rolling. They can't talk coverage. Then finally, there are public adjusters. That is me. And the public adjusters work for the homeowner. And they kind of keep the feet to the fire of all the other adjusters and say, hey, are you doing this right? That's what public adjusters are. So those are the different types of adjusters. Now we're going to move over to, let's move over to uh, first party insurance claim. First party insurance claim versus third party. What's the difference? So property casualty homeowner policies are first party contracts, first party insurance. Okay. So what that means is you have... Um, Party number one, maybe the insurance carrier. Party number two, um, or maybe the par uh, party, party number one, the homeowner. Party number two, the insurance carrier. Okay, two parties. They, they call it first party, and it's a uh, it's a defined set of perils. We saw that earlier, H01, H02, H03, either 10 or 16, or H03 being exclusionary. Okay, so it basically says, um, hey, I'm a homeowner, and if I give you X amount of uh, premium, then you'll cover up to this amount should any of these things happen. And defines the things, very clear, defines them. Okay, so if they happen, happen, and it's uncontested, yes, it's happened, then you owe for, oh, the, uh, the loss. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, there has to be damage, okay? There has to be damage to whatever is insured, okay? House, fence, whatever. Has to be a named peril, an event, okay? So named peril, that's the cause of the loss. Then it, there has to be a loss, okay? So that's some damage that causes the loss. And then um, once that happens, then, uh, then they owe because they paid premium. Now the insurance company owes. It's real simple. It's first party. It's a first party contract. First party insurance, first party claim. Third party claim is different, okay? Third party claim is, and there is third party liability in most homeowner contracts. Believe it or not, one interesting third party liability is if if uh, a homeowner slanders someone um, and trashes, uh, if, if a homeowner trashes like a company, they can be held liable for damage and a lot of those homeowner policies have coverage for that. So like if they blow off their mouth and uh, trash someone, you can sue the person and their insurance will pick it up. Interesting little thing. But third party, let's talk about it in a different sense because, okay, homeowner here, insurance company here, lawn right here and a big fat hole in the lawn with spikes sticking up and a sidewalk in front of it. And someone walking by and looking at their phone, steps in the pit, spikes up their feet and all of a sudden they say hey you didn't perform your duty of care to maintain a safe property property which is a side note maybe we'll get into that duty of care later about asking permission to remove the tree but everybody has a duty of care to kind of maintain their property right maintain and make sure i mean like you don't stick knives out you know in your grass 
whatever. You just don't do that type of thing. So you'd become liable. Sorry about that. You'd become liable for a dangerous situation should you not perform your duty of care. They step on the knives. Now all of a sudden they come to you and say, hey, you failed your duty of care to maintain minimal, like reasonable safety on your property. Um, and then at that point, I'm su they're suing you. And then they're going to the insurance. The insurance is going to cover it. So now we have a third party. Now, here's the interesting thing. With third party contracts, and it happens, our third party claims, it happens a lot with trees for neighbors. Ugh, it's the worst. Someone has their neighbor's tree hit their house, and all they want to do is they want to go to their neighbor because they don't want the, the deductible. And what they don't get is the liability in that tree falling over is not established. You don't know. I mean, you can't just right off the rip go to the next door neighbor and say, hey, I told you that tree was dangerous, even if you have an arborist report. The time it takes to file a claim and get things moving in comparison to first party, this guy over here, he could say, oh, I don't know about whether that was an arborist report or the carrier could say, ah, I'm not so sure it was a real arborist. Third party is so much harder to navigate through. First party, tick, 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 you pay premium, now you get benefits. It's just so simple. It's all drawn out in a nice little neat contract. Third party, who knows? Who knows why the knives were in the front porch or in the front grass? Who knows if the tree really was dangerous or if it wasn't? Maybe it was a 300 mile an hour wind, whatever. Okay. Maybe the guy, maybe they had some words going on that said different things that changed that type of thing. I'm just saying third party's hard to prove. Okay. Just going that, and that leads us into another um, definition, which is called um, subrogation. Uh, subrogation, take that same example, next door neighbor, tree falls, now it's on your house. What happens, the best way to do it is the homeowner, what they do is they file against their policy, leave it alone with whoever's liable. If they're liable, fine, we'll deal with it later. File on your policy now, get the ball rolling so you can catch some checks to get your roof tried in because that next door neighbor ain't doing it, not anytime soon, okay? And then later on, once it goes to that, um, once it goes through that process, well, then the, what will happen is your insurance company, this homeowner's insurance company will subrogate. They'll basically refile a claim against the next door neighbor and they'll say, hey, look, we have the evidence. Here's what happened. They had an arborist come over. The arborist looked at the tree and said, that tree needs to come down. They knew it needed to come down. They wouldn't have recommended that it come down if they wasn't. This actually happened to me, by the way. Uh, it was weird too, because we ended up doing the work for the person. And I was the guy who, um, who did the work over. I did, I gave the recommendation at this house, said, take it down, it needs to come down. Then I ended up pulling the tree off the house this company was ugh, very frustrating. Um, they got full value because they subrogated, but still they fussed with me on price forever, which was annoying because the other company's paying. But anyway, that's subrogation. When the, when the carrier understands there is a third party, they were liable and the carriers, and I did get an interesting little back end peep on that situation. And turns out, like I asked the guys, like, are you going to fight this? This is from the other company. And they were like, no, we don't fight it. We just typically agree and they move money around. It's really weird because they fight the homeowners like crazy. That, it was a very interesting thing. Okay, let's talk about indemnification. Indemnification is maybe my favorite word in insurance because to be indemnified is to be brought back to a pre-loss condition. That's insurance. Indemnification basically is the point of insurance to protect your financial position. You pay a premium so that you can be indemnified and you cannot um, be, it's not in betterment, but you cannot come out ahead. That's not okay. Uh, you have to come right up to equal, but you can't come, come out ahead. That's actually could be fraudulent. Like if you had two different policies, um, and you had a loss and you filed separately on those two policies, like um, you cannot say whatever it is. Say you have a car and you wreck the car 
and you bought two policies on it and you file for both uh, on both and get double money, woo, you don't want to do that. Uh, so indemnification is get brought back to just that amount. Oh, by the way, let's talk about that one real quick. Reasonable cost incurred. Um, I remember just cost incurred means to come up against. Okay, you came up against a cost. Like you didn't have a cost and then all of a sudden it popped up, right? Um, in fact, so to incur a cost does not mean that you've paid it. So be really careful about that. I had a, I had an adjuster and he was like, oh no, they didn't incur the cost because they never paid it. And I'm like, no, they're responsible for it. That's the definition is to be, to incur it. Whether the money's gone out of their account yet or not is it's, oh, an incurred cost is like when you le or when you um, purchase a car, you have now in, um, you have bills to pay on that car on your note. That's an incurred cost, right? That is a cost incurred that you owe. It doesn't matter whether you have paid it or not. That's something you're paying. Okay, so that's incurred cost. Invoice versus estimate, just they make estimates. If you bill hourly and you count up the hour and then they have uh, cost incurred, the homeowner owes you, then now all of a sudden it's cost incurred. That's an invoice. Let's just talk one other thing about... Um, one other thing that's um, interesting, uh, let's see, is the idea, of the mechanics of, and I'm just going to breeze on this real quick, but the mechanics of the policy, okay, the mechanics of who owes what to who, you do not have, at least in Georgia, because assignment of benefits are just so weak here. Some states, they're awesome. I think um, up in like Cedar Rapids, Iowa, they're pretty strong. But other states, they're horrible. So an assignment uh, of benefits takes the benefits owed on the policy and the homeowner can assign them. And they there's pre and post loss issues with that. So like there's clauses, anti-assignment clauses that unless the home, unless the insurance carrier pre-agrees to assign the benefits to whoever, then it's uh, you can't do it. The, the mechanics of it are the homeowner goes into contract. Here you are. Here's the homeowner. Here's the insurance company. So sorry about that. So the homeowner says, okay, I'll pay you this hourly rate. Okay, we'll do the rate. Okay, so now we got the contract. On my other video, we, we have the elements of contract. Okay, so that sets it up. They say, I agree. They say, uh, you say, okay, we'll do it. This is our price. So off you go. That's You're good there. Forget the assignment of benefits. Now, they have, there's another contract, and this says we'll pay the incurred cost if these perils happen. Remember, tick, 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 tick. So uh, we'll pay reasonable cost incurred. Reasonable, by the way, is the whole point of clarity market, is to establish reasonable. Right? Okay, so tick, 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 tick. So now all of a sudden, you do the work. They've incurred the cost. These guys owe you, and then these guys owe them. That's how that works. In, in a state where there's no AOBs allowed, you can't really easily sue the carrier. It's not happening. You're gonna it's you're gonna try to sue the carrier, and they're gonna say, "Sorry, you don't have a um an action against us because we have no contract with you." But you do have a contract with the homeowner. That's how that process works. Um, and we'll get into liens later on. But liens are a really good friend because they are a placeholder in line while you're working it out so that you can get paid. Okay, let's get into mitigation versus repair. So um, maybe one of the most pivotal differences in the process of homeowners moving forward with their claim, and that is mitigation versus repair, in that mitigation is to prevent further loss. Repair is to repair whatever got broken. Mitigation is very similar to the emergency room. And that's what Clarity Market is all about, is mitigation work. Um, I am so adamantly against getting estimates during mitigation because we don't do that at uh, for emergency rooms. No one does that because it's not safe. People would die if you like, oh, I'm going to go shop five emergency rooms. No. That, and that, as a side note, Federal government said, I don't know, like a year or two ago that 
emergency rooms had to have like at minimum machine readable codes for the pricing, right? So that it's not a surprise. And that's what Clarity Market does. It's not a surprise. It's just, here's our price, right? So that's what's so beautiful about this idea is that um, we're basically taking the market and making it clear. It's Clarity Market. Like it's very clear so that everybody's on the same page. No more surprises. And that's what I'm so excited about. But uh, mitigation, you can just kind of think of it like the emergency room, tree on a house, someone's in danger. There's a lot of other mitigation factors like drying in a house to prevent mold, uh, putting on a tarp, board up. Like if the side of the house is smacked, boarding it up. Obviously, my specialty has been mitigation removal of tree off structure. Then we do some tarping, a little bit of board up sometime. Okay, let's talk about the concept of contract of adhesion. This is just another quick definition. Contract of adhesion is an idea that when one party, insurance company over here, homeowner here, they write the policy, they sign the policy. The homeowner cannot change the policy. That's a contract of adhesion. When one party writes it and says, take it or leave it, the other person has to either take it or leave it because they can't change it. In those cases, um, if there is ambiguity, meaning most specifically, I would say when adjusters say, oh, we'll cover the part of the tree that's on the house. Well, it, the, there is no policy I've ever read that says the part of the tree. Okay. There is no part of, the only time a part of a tree becomes on a house is when it literally falls off and now a part is separated and boom, now that part of the tree is on the house. But when a tree falls across, let's say a fence as an example, tree falls across a fence, there is the tree. It says, we will cover the cost to remove the tree, not the part of the tree, the tree off of your, so sometimes they'll say, oh no, we only owe for this amount, that part. No, it doesn't say that. It says the tree. So let's talk about contract of adhesion. That's why I'm bringing it up. Oh, chop and drop. You know, the word chop and drop is not in a policy either. And you'll hear that. Oh, all we owe for is just removing it off the house. That's up to the homeowner to blah, 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 blah. No, no, we have to keep the job site safe. Okay, we're going to take the tree down. How do you suppose it gets from there into the, into, into the back of the truck to start hauling it? This is all part of the process so that the debris hauling can start once it's in the truck. Hauling starts when it's in the truck. Taking it off the house and getting it to the truck is part of taking it off the house. That's my argument because we cannot leave the job site in an unsafe manner. We have to like maintain a safe work environment for everybody. You know, you're like, you couldn't just take the tree down and pile it up against the side. How are the gutter cleaners, gutter repair guys and the roofer guys that the work site has to be safe? Contract of adhesion, okay? So the point is when there's ambiguity, the courts will lean to the benefit of the party who didn't have the chance to make it specific because if they did have the opportunity, maybe they would have said, oh, part, but they didn't. And these guys over here who wrote it, they weren't specific. So they need to be held responsible when there's ambiguity. That's a contract of adhesion. Sorry, I started getting a little too far. Um, oh, by the way, guys, Merlin, shout out to Chip Merlin, guys. I got to tell you, uh, let's see. There is one... Um, M-E-R-L-I-N-P-A-Y, Merlin Pay Up, okay? Guys, this book is so worth it. Get it. You can get it on Amazon or on Audible, and it will give you so much insight. Just get the book, Pay Up. It will open your ears and eyes. You'll be like, oh my gosh, do they really do that? Oh, baby. Okay, so Chip Merlin, guys. Shout out to Chip Merlin, man. Sign up for his, just subscribe, dude. Subscribe to his email list because he gives the drips, dude. You get the drip email and it is such good information. You get on his list because he sends it out. Like he sends it out, I don't know, once a week. You get a blog post, overturns coverage denial over the interpretation of sudden. So it was this issue with a toilet ring. 
And um, and let's see, ambiguous. Did I see the word ambiguities? So that was an issue, if I remember correctly, of like sudden, the sudden accidental. So anyway, that was just one thing about a toilet ring, I think, that leaked. Dude, Chip Merlin is the freaking bomb, dude. That guy. Okay, so that was contract of adhesion. Let's keep on going. Shout out to Chip, of course. Uh, let's see. Now, let's do coverage A, okay? So let's do coverage A, coverage B. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple real quick examples. This is coverage A, okay? Obviously, fell on the house. This was a great claim, by the way. This was a super fun claim. That PK-65, man, shout out to Jason Smith. That crane is so freaking bad, dude. That crane is so bad. This is coverage A, okay? Takahuchi lifting it off. Okay, let's go to coverage B, okay? So coverage A is like on the deck, on the house, on the garage, on the back porch, anything on the main structure. That's basic, right? Let's go to coverage B. This is one of my favorite stories. This is by far, oh, oh, this is coverage B. Oh, this is coverage B stumps. But we'll go to this one first. Okay, and I've told this story before. Lady calls me up in Jasper, Georgia, freaking out. Tree has fallen into another tree. And she's like, can you come up here? And I'm like, yeah, I can. We had like a couple other, I think we had other jobs that day. I know we did actually. And she's like, but she was the first call. And so I'm like, well, did it hit anything? No, it's hung up in another tree. And I'm like, well, this is really expensive. She's like, I don't have any money. I'm like, oh my gosh. And it, there are certain times when you're in emergency work where it's just like, dude, your heart hurts because you're like, you, I could hear it. She did not have any money. And, and I knew there was no coverage. And I went round and round. Did it do anything? Did it, did it bump against a wall? Blah, 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 blah. Nothing, dude. Nothing. Okay. So, and by the way, as a side note on coverage B, you always got to be careful because coverage B will be a percentage typically a percentage of the value of the house. So like if that house is worth $100,000, the max you're getting is 10, on most policies, 10,000 bucks. So just be careful because, and and it can get even worse too, because if if they, like in Cedar Rapids, there was one house that it fell and told, and remember coverage B in Cedar Rapids, as I was telling you earlier, was like separated garages were considered coverage B. And this one tree fell on that separated garage and our bill was like fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars, and her her house was like worth one hundred fifty thousand bucks. We chewed up the whole stinking, or maybe two twenty or something, whatever. But her deductible was like four thousand bucks. So if it was two twenty, four thousand seventeen, we chewed the whole thing up just pulling the tree off. Um, so just be careful because you can get yourself in a pinch with coverage B situations, especially with named hurricane deductibles. Ugh. Then all of a sudden there is no coverage B because the deductible is practically higher than the, anyway, higher than the coverage B would allow anyway. Okay. Lady calls me and I'm like, I, I go over and over and I'm like, well, is there, you know, this, is there that, is there a wall? Is there this? No, 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 no. I'm like, ma'am, I don't think I can do this because we got to bill your carrier and you don't have, I know you don't have coverage. She's like, well, please. And I'm like, I was just like, talk to my husband. I'm like, I'm like, okay. So I go through the thing. Is there a, a retention wall? Did it hit? Did it, uh, did it, a lot of times it's retention walls. Did it, is there a fence back there? No, no fence. So the husband gets on the phone. We go through everything. And I say, was there a fence? Cause I was hoping for an uproot. He's like, no. I was like, man, I don't think, I don't think we can help you. And he's like, okay, well, well, thank you anyway. I was like, okay. And I was, and or he's just about to hang up. I said, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, one other thing. And I forgot. I said, when that root ball came up, did, did, did it uproot any underground utilities? He had already told me there was a creek in the back and it was on the other side of the creek. I'm like, what utilities are going to be behind there? And he's like, what? And I'm like, yeah. I'm, oh, dude, I got goosebump factors. Goosebump. It was bad to the bow, baby. I was so excited for this guy. Okay. He had run a dog fence. Dude, look at these pictures. 
Listen, I get excited when there is coverage. Look at this. Da, da, da. That sucker. I mean, like, who is going to run a dog fence on the other side of a creek? This client. This client did. It was bad to the bone. When I heard that, I was like, you got to go take a picture. I need to see this. Because I was so happy. I'm telling you, I was so happy to find find a reason that I could validate going up there, taking the risk. And sure enough, look at that beauty. You cannot put that line back in the ground because you got to dig it. And if you got to dig it, you're going to cut roots. And look at, look at, let me just show you. You are not going to be able to dig anywhere around there. You cannot send OSHA men, you cannot send men to work in that environment until that thing is comes down, okay? That has to come down. That is an unsafe, ANSI standard OSHA violating procedure. If you go, especially digging stinking roots, you have to be the safest amount possible. Obviously, the tree has to come down, right? So we got to do what we do, secure it as best as we can, do our job so that the men can come in Look at that big old fatty root ball sitting right there. How are you going to rebury that cable? You cannot go in there and cut. And I'm telling you guys, this customer or this adjuster went over and over. Because here's the deal. They accepted liability. We sent the, I don't know, this was like a $16,000, $17,000 job, right? And they accepted liability. Hold on just a second. I'll just show you. You guys got to check it out. We got big shiny out there. And uh, that's what I call my crane, by the way, big shiny. Uh, because when it showed up in my house, I was like, oh, it's so big and shiny and nice. Um, I love my crane, by the way. I love my crane. Look at that stinking thing. Are you kidding? Dude, that thing was all the way over here. Can you see now why that customer was just like freaked out? And you couldn't cut the stump. If you cut the stump, it could release. And then what are you going to do? Oh, I was trying to bury and these this insurance carrier was like, "Oh, well, we'll just wait for you to for we'll wait for you to remove the tree and then we'll do because what they did is they accepted liability and said, "Oh yeah, okay, valid claim. This is one covered peril wind, two caused damage, but it only caused $265 worth of damage, doesn't meet the claim deductible. So, this is it. We're done. We've closed the file." And they closed it. And I was like, uh, yeah, no, you're not going to close it because it's cost incurred. There's coverage and everybody there has to follow OSHA and they paid it. They paid it after like, I don't know. It was like six to six weeks to three months and they drug their feet, but they, they can't fight it. At the end of the day, you take premium on first party liability and it hits the thing. You got to pay. That's it. If you can't handle that, then don't be in the business. Anyway, I was so happy to find coverage for that particular client. Anyway, that was coverage B. Man, coverage B is all day long in a bag of chips, dude. This thing, this thing blew that fence out right there. That actually gets stump grinding, right? Stump grinding included on that one. And they, I mean, they argued, eh, stump grinding's not included. Well, how are you building the fence right there? if there's no stump grinding. This one was coverage A, and buddy, look at that freaking gas tank we were working up. And this was the neighbor's fence too. Like this, this was the client's fence. Coverage B right here, obviously, to get all that done from that blow over. There were two trees, but then stinking this fence right there. Holy shnikes, Batman. This is a great example, coverage, uh, coverage B. Okay, just right down on a fence. Um, and, you know, keep in mind with us, we have minimums, man. We have minimums to deploy our team. And you cannot tell me that a toddler can climb around on that. That's a mitigation situation. That is dangerous. That could hurt someone for sure. Um, coverage B, coverage B. Um, this was, I think this was actually coverage B here, but this one actually hit the house. Man, we that was long stretch, bro. I was at the end. Okay, that's my last extension right there. And and I had the grapple on too. It's because like, I just didn't want to take the grapple off. So it was just faster to take a few small sh uh, chunks. Coverage B. Hey, this one's good. This was coverage A and coverage B. But I wanted to show you, always look close for the damage. 
Look close because it's there. Um, this is a friend of mine. This was coverage B up in Kentucky. Um, okay, this was coverage B, backyard, shed, plus fence. Um, this was a coverage. This was A and B, actually, because let's see. Did I get that other picture? Oh, I didn't. This was coverage B. And guys, I, I uh, shoot, I didn't include this sucker went up. This was like a this claim was like I think 15 G's or something. This was a hard tree to get down because it was over some other stuff. You can see the guy standing right there. Like that's a decent sized tree, and all that was damaged was that little amount. Um, just that. But they have to fix it, and you can't take that down because it was it was hanging over all this other neighbor's fences, and it was a mess to get down. Man, we had six guys on that. For hours and hours and hours getting that thing taken apart. Five guys, I think. Oh, I don't know. Maybe six. I forget. Okay, guys. That's the end of a really long video. I hope you really liked it. I hope it's um, helping you. Hit me up with questions. Please hit the like. Hit the share. Hit the subscribe. Um, and join up on Clarity Market, man. We're here to uh, help you in every step of this process. We are going to totally open the doors to every step of the way. And uh, help you get paid the money that you deserve to get paid and help you understand so that you can go through the process and um, and and argue uh, argue these claims because you need to understand it. And so I hope you really enjoy the software and just hit me up with any questions. And that's it for right now, but we're going to have some more videos coming uh, continually. So enjoy, hit the like, hit the share, hit the sub, and we'll see you on the next one. Y'all take care.